Good morning, everybody. Let's try that again. Really hoping that the sound is okay. We're going to bin the microphones. Um, Rod is watching the camera, and if we can see that it's not okay, um, we will do something different. So, welcome to the service at the Tab. Uh, it's the Irvine family here, and Simon, who's part of our bubble, uh, this is my big brother, um, and he's come to sing with us. So, thank you for coming, Simon. Um, we hope that you're all well, and we hope that you enjoy this worship. Let's come to worship. Prepare our hearts, O oh God. Help us to receive. Break the hard and stony ground. Help our unbelief. Plant your word deep down in us. Cause it to bear fruit. Open up our ears to hear. Lead us in your truth. <laughs>
A reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 9 and 18 to 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came up and ate it. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what it was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word at once, and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among, among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but worries of this life, and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making us unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what it was sown. Thank you, Isaac, for that reading. Let us continue now in the prayer that Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So our reading this morning was on the parable of the sower. But how green are your fingers? Having had both sets of parents or grandparents spend their lives working in farms in rural Ireland, you'd think these hands would be pure emerald green. I should be able to grow a potato with the click of my fingers. I inherited many traits from my family. Skill with growing plants was not one of them. In these unprecedented times when we are spending a lot of time at home and we have been blessed with sunny and dry weather, many of us have taken to spending time in the garden, the Irvine family included. However, not all of us can easily bring forth fruit from a few seeds. I personally tend to leave the gardening to Emma. At the beginning of lockdown, our two boys spent the Easter holidays camping in our back garden. Little did we know then that the consequences would be and how long it would last. Now we are creeping out of it but we had had an issue with our lawn and two weeks under a tent had not helped, but instead exposed the issue for all to see. Let me explain. We realised that during lockdown and with the good weather, we could deal with a neglected space in our family home, the garden. With some effort and patience, we, well, Emma, have discovered how wonderful it is to be a sower. 
nurturing something you cannot see, giving it the right environment, celebrating with the first shoots and reaping the joys of a harvest. We have a completely new space and aspect to our family life. Emma has planted some new grass. It is like a golf green, luscious grass, which in bare feet feels like you're walking on velvet. But some areas of the lawn were still dying. Luscious grass was next to brown grass that looked like it was dead. These dead patches were where the tent had been over the Easter period. Under the tent, things happened which we could not see. Some patches of fungal growth, like a talcum powder in the soil, had formed. This disease was hidden from view, but damaging what we could see. We see the analogy that we should not hide our faith. We need to show all our spiritual green shoots and the velvet growth of our Christian faith. Recognise recognising when those next to us may be struggling and in need of assistance. A man walked into a flower shop and asked for some potted red geraniums. I'm sorry, said the florist. We are completely sold out of all our potted geraniums. However, I would be more than happy to give you a deal on something else. Could you use African violets instead? The customer replied sadly, no, it was geraniums my wife told me to water while she was away. You would think that a simple task like watering plants would not be too hard for a guy, but speaking from experience, I can sympathise with this man. I realise there are people watching or listening that really like gardening, but I am not of that ilk. I am terrified of watering in his orchids. <laughs> There is a whole ritual and skill to tending orchids that I, personally, do not get. Emma even has calendar reminders on her phone to ensure everything happens as it should for these orchids, such as her patience and dedication. Watering plants is just about my skill level. I was indeed trusted with buying a sprinkler for the new lawn. But if I want some vegetables, I'll go to the supermarket or greengrocer and get some. But, of course, somebody had to grow the vegetable that I bought at the greengrocers. Our farmers worked long and hard to ensure that the greengrocer can sell me fresh fruit and vegetables. They had the finest tractors, ploughs, harvesters, and these days even drones and satellites. Because of their patience, skill and the tools at their disposal, they can literally feed us all. Back in the days of Jesus, however, farmers had a lot less to work with. The picture we see here in Matthew chapter 13 is that of the common farmer. They do not have the tools to properly prepare all of the ground and make it ready for the seed. The farmer simply reaches into the seed bag, takes out handful after handful of seed and flings it across the ground. This is a process known as broadcasting the seed. When I read this passage, I often like to think that as well as listening, the people could also be looking. From his boat on the lake, Jesus may have seen a farmer on the hillside broadcasting his seed. The people listening on the shore could also watch this farmer while Jesus explained the parable of the sower, or the parable of the seed, or the parable of the soils, as it is also known. Because of the haphazard way the farmer broadcasts the seed, some of it falls on nearby hard-packed path. Some falls among the rocks. Some falls on weedy and thorny ground. But then, some of it falls on fertile ground and the seed takes root and gives a 
going to a crop. Now Jesus is telling a story. Jesus is telling a story to illustrate how God intended to spread the gospel across the land and bring people to salvation. This parable of the sower is recorded for us in three of the gospels. Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4 and Luke chapter 8. In all three accounts, Jesus explains the parable, the role of the sea and the significance of the soil. However, for this parable, Jesus will not explain to the disciples who the sower is. I believe the reason for that is that the emphasis in this parable is on the soil and how it affects the outcome of the seed. So let us look at these two elements of the parable. Who or what is the seed? Jesus reveals to his disciples the answer to that question in all three accounts. From today's reading, verse 19 says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. The seed is the word of the Lord, broadcast by God. Consider the power contained in just a little seed. If I were to hold a few apple seeds in my hand, there would be the possibility of an entire orchard. That is exciting because even if I only talk to a handful of folk at the other end of this virtual link, if I can just get one seed planted, then it can spread and reproduce and be fruitful for ages to come. Jesus makes clear for us that those who hear the word of God are represented by the soil. Jesus is using this parable to show us the condition of the hearts of those who receive his word and recognise the love of God. But how does Jesus explain these conditions in the parable to his disciples? Firstly, we have the hard ground on the path. In verse 4, the birds came and ate up the seed which in verse 9 Jesus explains as when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it the evil one come and snatches away that what was sown in their heart Jesus tells us that these are people who hear the word of God but do not understand it it does not penetrate their lives it just sits there until the evil one snatches it away they hear the same message that we all do. The seed is the same for everyone. No one has access to better seed than anyone else. Yet they do not understand the need for a saviour in their lives. It does not even make it into their thoughts, much less their hearts. I wonder what has dulled their mind so much to receive the glory of God's word and yet made it their heart so hard? Is it that they like the ground have been trampled and beaten down and nothing is expected of them? Secondly, we have the rocky ground. From verse 5 and explained by Jesus in verse 20 and 21 as the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Are these people who actually become Christians by receiving Jesus Christ as their personal saviour? No, I don't think so. Jesus says the reason this person faith lasts only a short time is because they have no root. 
there is no connection to what is needed to nourish and sustain life, or to put it in spiritual terms, there is no connection to the Holy Spirit. There was never a connection to the Holy Spirit. Thus, the faith was never genuine, and these people were never truly a believer of Jesus Christ. But, why would they have received the word with joy at one point? Why would people claim to believe in Christ if they really don't? There are a number of reasons for that. Some people have a head belief, which never connects with the heart. They believe the facts about Jesus, but never embrace him as their saviour. They believe in Jesus, much like they believe in the policies of a political party. It is merely an intellectual belief, not a true biblical faith acted out in their daily lives. As the saying goes, some people miss heaven by 18 inches, which is the distance from their head to their heart. Others give an outward profession of faith in Christ, not because they really trust in Jesus, but because they want to please someone else. This is not real faith. There is no root. When troubles or persecution or just something more interesting comes along, they forget all about their Christianity. They wither because they have no root system. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. They are shallow. They dress up. They show up. But they do not have Jesus in their hearts. Their minds may understand God's plan of salvation and it may touch their heart, but it does not penetrate that heart. They hear the word of God, but they have no root. It has affected them a little, but the sun, the wind and the rain have more influence and effect on them. Without a root system, they bear no fruit. Now, thirdly, we have the thorny or weed infested soil in which seed grows but is subsequently choked. Jesus explains in verse 22 the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word but worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Again, like before, we have soil that is receptive to the word. They hear the word. They may even understand it in their minds. The seed begins to grow, but unfortunately, thorns competing for that soil choke it. What separates this soil from the rocky soil is time. Those represented by the rocky soil are like firework rockets. They are lit. They shoot high, burst and make a noise, and then they are done. This thorny soil represents that big flower, the one with the really, really long fuse, so you have time to get away. You light it and wait with anticipation as the fuse slowly burns, and then nothing. These people are around a while, they look like they may do something great, and then nothing. They may be long-time church members, but are easily drawn away. They come to church, or in these times, log on to church, to hear a good sermon. Maybe they even read their Bible and participate in a Bible study of some kind. But they have things that are competing for that time. And in this case, those things overpower the green shoots that have started to grow. They're concerned equally with the things of God and the things of the world. They go to church, read their Bibles, 
and will do anything to get ahead in life. Jesus says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. This thorny soil has potential to bear fruit. Weeds and thorns need nutrients too. But because it is sharing ground with weeds and thorns, the young plant becomes choked and cannot produce fruit. I remember a number of years ago, a past member of this church telling me that any plant can be a weed. It is not the plant that is the weed. It is where it grows that makes the weed. A beautiful rose in the middle of a patch of daisies is still a weed. And so too in this parable. The thorns in our eyes are not bad unless we let them distract us from the word of God and our lives as Christians. That brings us finally to the good soil, as in verse 8. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times that what was sown. But what makes the soil good? Jesus explained it to his disciples as, the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. The good soil are those who hear the word and understand it. The good soil takes time to hear the word and let it penetrate their head, their heart, their lives. To hear the word, we need to be in church, not just physically or virtually, but mentally as well. That means showing up, logging on, ready to experience God and his message for us. Focusing our mind on being in the presence of the Lord. Putting in the time and effort to listen actively, to understand, and ultimately to act. The final part of the parable describes three different yields resulting from seed planted in good soil, 100-fold, 60-fold, and 30-fold. What would it look like at the tab, or in your church, or in your life to experience this level of growth? What would have to change? How would we have to adapt? Are we actually hungry for growth such as this? Or have we become comfortable with the yields we currently experience? In preparing this sermon, I was curious as to an expected yield from a single seed. When I was walking the dog during the last week, I stopped and counted 76 barley seeds on a single plant. A yield of a hundredfold is almost impossible for us to achieve, but God can do it. In contemporary farming, seeds are sown in neat lines with a carefully calculated distance between them, designed to maximise growth and minimise waste. The sower in this parable takes a very different approach. They broadcast their seeds, casting them far and wide, not precise and lacking in the finesse of a modern farmer. But this approach means that seed travels a significant distance. How might we broadcast our message of salvation far and wide? How might modern communication help us to broadcast? In these times of social distancing and restrictions, I am broadcasting this message to you remotely. From my perspective, this is very strange. Rather than talking to a congregation where I can see faces and read expressions, I am looking at the lens of a mobile phone. No reactions, no immediate feedback, be that good or bad, only a small reflection of light from the lens. However, broadcasting from the tab, like the big little sewer, has the potential to reach many more people than our previous 
face-to-face -face services in this physical building. We are still the town, but we now have more soil than we did before. Some of this soil may be like a hard pathway, some may be rocky and some are thorny, but maybe we have some new fertile soil at the other end of this virtual broadcast. At this moment, we do not know, and we may never know. Many people turn this parable into a salvation message. They say, if you are one of the first three kinds of soil, now is the time to get right with God. You can still change. You can still become good soil. This is not what Jesus is saying. In verse 9 he says, Whoever has ears, let them hear. Jesus explained this parable, not to those who needed saving, but those who were already saved. The reason Jesus told those who fell into the good soul category, the explanation, was to prepare them to produce fruit and to make them aware. These were the people who were going to become the early church. This was Jesus broadcasting his message to seed the first churches. Jesus was patient, but he recognised the challenges of the word and the challenges ahead. This type of patience can be difficult, but can also help in bearing fruit. There is a story about a student from MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who spent an entire summer travelling to rival Harvard University's football field. It's a short distance, only a few miles. Every day, wearing a black and white striped shirt, this student walked up and down the football field for 10 or 15 minutes, throwing birdseed and blowing a whistle. Then, he'd walk off the field and travel back to me. At the end of the summer, the American football season started. It was time for Harvard University to play their first home game. As the game was about to begin, the referee walked onto the field and blew his whistle. The game had to be delayed for half an hour to wait for the birds to get off the field. The student from MIT wrote his thesis on this and graduated. Now, had you been watching this student throughout the summer, walking up and down Harvard's football field, you probably would not have understood his objective. But once the American football season began, his purpose would be very, very clear. This young man did all that he did that summer in order to accomplish two goals. Firstly, he wanted to write a powerful thesis on conditioned response and to graduate with honours from it. Secondly, he wanted to irritate the rival students at Harvard University. He accomplished both with the power of a little C and a lot of patience. Farmers do not plant on a Monday and expect to reap on Tuesday or even the next week or the next month. It takes patience and trust to bear fruit. We often will never know the results of our witness. I believe we will some have some surprising discoveries in heaven. A great example of this is the work we do with our children and young people. To keep with the soil, the, sorry, to keep with the soil analogy, this is the compost in our church. When we work with the children and young people, we're sowing seeds on compost. Very fertile soil. But we need to be patient. We cannot expect to see the fruit overnight. It may take many, many years of nurturing, but seed can remain dormant for a long time. Egyptologist tells of seeds 3,000 years old being planted in rich soils and then germinating and 
growing into new plants. During lockdown, I'm listening to all the previous episodes of The Infinite Monkey Cage. This is a Radio 4 show focusing on various aspects of science. One theme that has been running for a number of years is, can a strawberry ever be dead? The discussion being that through the power of a dormant seed, a strawberry never really dies. Even if it looks to our eyes as a dead strawberry, given the correct stimulus, life in the form of a new strawberry plant can spring forth. The seed of the strawberry always contains life. And so it is with this parable. God broadcast the seed. It may remain dormant for nearly a lifetime, but it always has the potential to grow and produce fruit. As Christians and as a church, we need to recognise that the world is filled with lots of the wrong soil. We can see this in fellow Christians around us, and we can recognise those who are the wrong soil. This is not a call to start condemning those around you. It is a call for you to stop expecting those around you to do the Lord's work. Let the Lord use you wherever and whenever he can. We need to recognise that we cannot do this alone. We need the help of those Christians around us. And of course, we need the love and guidance of God. We need the Lord to abide with us to ensure we are good soil, not a hard path, rocky soil or thorny soil. Good soil, rich in the nutrients of God's love and word, patient in growth, ready to bear fruit into the world. Amen. join us in a beautiful old traditional hymn, Abide With Me.
response for this, which you will, I'm sure, all know. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. Do join us in praying. God of all seeds, all soils and all stories, we pray for the wisdom to apply the truth of Jesus' parables to our own lives, to our lives together in this virtual place where we now worship you and this community where we serve you. May we see you, may we hear you, May we know you care. have been washed away. We pray too for those in our own country who face continual upheaval and heartache through repeated flooding. May we see you, may we hear you, may we know you care. and charities that try to help all who are struggling. May we see you, may we hear you, may we know you care. And we 
whose seeds are watered by their tears, those grieving the loss of someone close to them, those who feel forgotten, those who are neglected, those who are victims of injustice, abuse or cruelty. May they, and all in any kind of need today, see you. May they hear you. May they know you care. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. Oh, Lord, hear my prayer. Thank you, Emma, for those lovely words. And thank you, Simon, for joining us today and adding your uh, your dulcet tones to uh, to the Irvine family in our bubble. And everybody up there, stay safe and look after yourselves. Amen. Amen.